All right, good evening. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. And if you're not here this morning, you'll be fine. It's kind of like one of those movies where they have a sequel, but if you didn't see the first one, you actually can completely understand the second one. That's how this is. So you'll be okay. Uh, it would be kind of neat to put the two together if you missed out on it, but uh, you'll be fine if you weren't here or you didn't hear it. Romans chapter 1, I do need to make a correction from this morning. I think I said in Sunday school, I know I said in Sunday school that uh, Paul was not supposed to go to Rome. The Lord told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And then he went anyway and ended up getting, ended up in bonds. And then as a result of that, he ended up going to Rome. A lot in between there, but I misspoke, so I wanted to correct that. Because we're in the book of Romans, and Paul was very close to some people, believers, in what place? In Rome, hence the book of Romans. So Romans chapter 1, verse 18, we are going to read a lengthy section, start in verse 18, go all the way down to the end of the chapter, and then we will launch out here tonight. Romans 1, 18. Yes, sir? No sheet tonight, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Have to take your own notes. Yep. Yeah. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Okay, it's going to get rough here. And the reason why it's going to be rough is because those verses tell you about God making it very clear to every man that he exists. If you look at verse 19, I'll give you a couple things from verse 19. It says, because that which may be known of God is manifest where? In them. You know what God gave every man? A conscience. Basic right and wrong in every man given to him by God. And then if you look at verse 20, there's another proof that God exists. It is the creation. So when a man rejects his conscience or goes against his conscience, and then he also says, ah, there's no God, in spite of all the creation surrounding him that screams that God exists, this is the downward spiral. So this will be very rough reading. But as you read, I think you will probably recognize that here we are in June of 2023, and this is exactly where we are, and not just in America, but practically all around the world. So here we go. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Does this sound familiar? This really good description of the world we're living in. 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which, do, which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's some rough reading, isn't it? 
but it's true. And we'll talk about tonight, I will not give you the title just yet, I'll tell you after we pray, but we're going to discuss this downward spiral that occurs when an individual, you could say a nation, an entire society, rejects the conscience God's given them and the very clear evidence that there is a creator within the creation, just looking at the creation. So we'll see this slippery slope that people go down whenever they reject the Lord. So let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, again for just what we have in front of us, your perfectly preserved words. Thank you for the people that were interested enough in hearing from you tonight to be here. We want to pray that this is time well spent, and we are asking for your Holy Spirit to just put the light on the scriptures for us. May the words that come forth out of my mouth be exactly what you want, and may it be very clear to all of us what you are saying, and may I just not get in the way of that. May we come away tonight with just a, an awareness of the world we're living in, but also fully aware of the purpose you have placed us at this time and this place, uh, a great purpose that you've uh, given us in living here in this world. And we just ask that we would be faithful to fulfill your will in our lives in the time we have remaining, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I have this timeline in my Bible, and I have a timeline of this being written around 60 A.D., so you can do the math, 20, too bad Miley's not here, she would love this, 2023 minus 60, okay, I'm not going to do the math, it's over 1900, okay, actually about 1960 right around there, so over 1960 years ago, these words were written, and God gave them to Paul to write down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I think it's phenomenal that they are a perfect description of what's happening now this is more proof to stack on the list of this book is god's book he said some things here a long time ago how things would be and it's just happening right before our eyes so i would like to point out there's there's so many different ways to outline this passage and i want to point out as i usually do three points it's the same tonight but i want to point out three different places where you see some form of the word change. Take a look at verse 23. We'll take our points from this. Verse 23, and changed what? The glory, the glory of the uncorruptible God. There's the first change. I'll tell you more about that in a second. The second one's in verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. We'll spend some time on that one. And then go to verse 26. At the end of verse 26 for the third one, it says even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Now, our world really likes that word change. And I will tell you, change is not always a bad thing. But when the world talks a lot about changes... It is often due to them not wanting things to be in line with what God says. Very interesting. So that you say, well, how do you, where do you get that, Rockwell? Let me give you a great example. In the 2008 presidential campaign, we had the Republican, John McCain, up against the Democrat, Barack Hussein Obama. And the campaign cry from the Obama campaign was, hope and change. A little more clearly, their campaign slogan, his campaign slogan was, change, well, ultimately, but change we can believe in. And it was followed up with, yes, we can. Change we can believe in. So I have appropriately titled the message, change we cannot believe in. There's the message, of, the title of the message for tonight. There are changes mentioned in this passage that we cannot line up with. If you're going to be on God's, God's side, you just absolutely cannot do it. So there were many changes that actually took place during the Obama presidency. I will let you determine how many of those changes resulted in a better America. Affordable Care Act. Do I need to say any more? <laughs> we could go on a different tangent with that. I will not. But in churches today, let's just turn it into churches rather than just talk, talking about politics. In churches today, when change is mentioned, this is not always. So don't, don't think that this is every time, but often it has to do with putting away something that is biblical and 
exchange for something that is not biblical. The problem is that which is advertised as not really being biblical is advertised as being better than what we previously had or what they want to change. So you have to watch out for that. Now, it's not always like that, but oftentimes change in churches, particularly when it comes to time-tested things that have been in churches for a long time, change is usually not a good thing. Can you agree with that? I know it's not every time. You can't say that every time, but oftentimes that is the case. I'm not talking about changing the color of the carpet either. I'm not talking about that. That's silly. We're talking about changing God's word. We'll talk about that tonight. That's the big one. And oftentimes in a church, you, you folks have been around a while, you know this, oftentimes the thing that precedes changing the Bible is changing the music in the church. They seem to just fall. It's like a domino. And they change the music. That gets a little crazy. And then before you know it, they say, oh, we can't we throw out that King James Bible. We've got to get something else updated, updated and easy, more easy to understand. And those changes are not good. They're not good changes. Particularly, obviously, the, the, the change in the Bible is no good. I'll talk more about that in a second here. So if you take a look, let's just dive in here in verse 23. If you notice here, it's very interesting. This wording is just so in line with what's happening in our world today. It says there, actually, let's pick it up in 21. 21, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were what? Thankful. That's interesting right there. Come back to that in a minute. It says, become, they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. So when an individual or a society does not give God the glory he deserves and is not thankful for what God has blessed them with. Folks, what is the result? It tells you at the end of verse 21, what must come about? A man's heart becomes what? Go ahead. His, a man's heart becomes darkened. Now watch how a man with a darkened heart thinks and believes. Look at verse 22. What's the first word, everybody? 22? Profess. Professing. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So people with darkened hearts, according to your Bible, are professors. <laughs> Isn't that right? Professing. Who is a person that professes? A professor. And where do so many people in our world go to find the truth? The, I mean, the university can't be wrong. The college can't be wrong. These guys are really smart. They have a bunch of degrees. Surely they couldn't be wrong, but they're wrong oftentimes, particularly whenever they reject God, don't give them glory, and are not thankful. So it says, professing themselves to be wise, what do they become? What are they actually? They think they're smart, but they're actually fools. And I'll just begin with this. I was going to go to this passage this morning, but you can look at it on your own. Psalm 14 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What is the common thread in so many of our universities and colleges today? There is no God. That's what the professors, so many of them will say, thinking they're smart. But what does the Bible say they are? It says those professors are fools, and anybody who believes there is no God is a fool, according to the Bible. I didn't say that. That's what God said. So you got issue with that. Uh, take it up with the Lord. So let's take a look at this first one. It says in verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made light to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So the first point tonight is changing the glory of God. Changing the glory of God. So it says there that what they have changed the glory of God into is a what? What do you see there in verse 23? A little audience participation here tonight. Keep you engaged. What have they changed it into? Before it says the specifics about the birds and all, it says they've changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into a what? An image. Men are obsessed with images. Isn't that something? So most recently, some of you know, I went to Paris Island, South Carolina, and I got a little taste of how the United States Marine Corps trains their recruits. I can tell you all about that later if you want to hear more about it. 
But one day they took us to talk to the chaplain on the base, and it was very, very informative and interesting. And they took us into the chapel, and inside the chapel, all of us, there's, there's like 60 people in my group, and so many people at the same time we walked in and sat down noticed the same thing. Up in the front, they had a door, and the door just happened to be almost right in the middle. So you could see it was a, one of those revolving doors. It's a stage with a revol giant revolving door. So basically, the entire backdrop of the stage changes when they flip it around. Well, they had it flipped halfway around so you could see both sides. And this was so unique. On one side was a cross and just the cross. On the other side was a cross and a person, a person on the cross. So I knew exactly what this was. And some people were, were wondering, how come they have that? And of course, I knew, and many of you probably know. And they actually asked the chaplain, and he explained it really well. Thank the Lord, this chaplain that we got to hear from sure did seem to be uh, much of, very much of a Bible-believing chaplain, which is kind of rare in the military today, from what I understand. But he went ahead and explained what it was all about. The side with the individual, the image, I might add, the image on the cross is what is used for the Catholic services. And if you have ever set foot in a Catholic church, Jesus is on the cross because they partake of the mass. And every time they partake of the mass, what are they recreating? His death on the cross. Now, folks, the book of Hebrews tells you Jesus Christ died how many times? Once for all. But they essentially re-crucify him every time there's a mass. He's still on the cross. And then, of course, on the other side, you've been in, in many churches where there's crosses, and, and somewhere in here we've got them, and, but there's no Jesus on the cross. You know why? He's not there anymore. He died on the cross. He was taken down. He was buried. He rose again, and he ascended to heaven. He's not on the cross anymore. He already paid the price. But I bring that up because men have this obsession with changing the glory of God into an image, something they can see and look to and say, that's Jesus, when it's as far away from Jesus as you could ever imagine. If you've seen a, a, an image of Jesus or a statue of Jesus, that's not Jesus, folks. And oftentimes that's worshiped, and you obviously have to be aware of that. Be careful about that and not fall into that nonsense. So when a man, I got to thinking about images and how men make images. When men make images, they often make them to reflect their own greatness. So I've been to uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, and they have this one room where all the Hall of Famers are. Well, they're not actually there, but their images are in there. And it's gold, and their faces are on these plaques all around this room. And it's interesting how men, when they want to declare themselves or somebody else as great and give glory to them, they make images of them. Isn't that something? Now, I'm not even getting into the modern world of technology with images. Zane can tell you some stuff about that. He showed us this past Wednesday that's a little scary. But nonetheless, what does your Bible say men will change the glory of God to? Images. For many years, it's been statues. I think we're transitioning now to visual images on a screen. And in the tribulation, what is it that will be worshipped? What is it? Of all things, what's worshipped? Uh, more specifically, the image of the beast. Beware of those images. See, man takes God out and substitutes God with an image. And what happens is God does not get the glory that only he deserves when that happens. Now, uh, a couple of you noticed in verse 23, the wording here. Now, again, this is written in 60 A.D., Anybody know, before I read here, does anybody know around the year that Charles Darwin came out with the book on the origin of species? Around the year, anybody got a roundabout idea? Yeah, I believe, I believe you're on the money there, if I'm not mistaken, 1859. Okay, 1859. So over 1,800 years after the Apostle Paul wrote these words, Charles Darwin comes out with uh, his famous book. So let's take a look at what verse 23 says. It says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed four beasts and creeping things. What does the theory of evolution teach? 
that man came from animals, evolved. So here's, I got this off of a, a website. This is the modern way of thinking. This is the evolutionary way of thinking. Here you go. Ready for this? this you have to laugh when you read this, when I read this. Quote, birds, they're mentioned there, birds are dinosaurs. Actually, birds and mammals are technically reptiles as they descended from the very first reptile. Birds are more intimately related to dinosaurs as they branched off from a dinosaur. The first group of reptiles split 300 million years ago. Some 40 million years later, a group called Therapsid, Therapsids branched off, and this group eventually evolved to become what we now deem modern mammals, end quote. You notice what was mentioned in that quote? Birds were mentioned. Beasts, mammals, right? And then four-footed beasts. And then we're also in that verse is creeping things. You know what the word reptile comes from? The Latin word repeer, which means to creep. Isn't that something that the Lord would have that recorded that way? It goes, change the glory of God and substitute it with an image made like to man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things so that man believes that he's really nothing more than an animal. And if a man believes he came from an animal, he has every right to behave like an animal. I will not even take the time to get off and tell some of the nonsense in the world associated with that. Professing themselves all the while, professing themselves to be what? Wise. <laughs> what a bunch of, I'm being biblical, what a bunch of fools to think that and to believe that and to push it off on somebody. Once there was a tadpole when I began to begin, then there was a frog with my tail tucked in. Then there was a monkey in a banyan tree. Then it was a professor with a PhD. <laughs> it's the modern way of thinking. That's what you have to conclude based on what their belief is. So there's the first thing. When God's glory is changed, look what deluded thinking results. What a mess. Don't change God's glory. Instead, give glory that God deserves. Give it to him. Give God the glory. Okay, whew, that was a tough one, wasn't it? Let's move on to the next one. Verse 25, the second change that we cannot believe in. The second one, verse 25. Uh, oh, you know what? I didn't even read 24 before I go to the second point. After this belief in what ultimately became evolution, look at verse 24. It says, wherefore God, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor. What is it that they're going to dishonor? Their own bodies between themselves. Now, that will actually be built upon in verses that follow, and you get a little more insight on what that, that's all about. But just reading it, that does not sound good. You can see it's heading down a pretty rotten path. More about that in a second. So let's go to the next change, verse 25. The second change that we do not want to believe in, we don't want to associate with. 25 who changed the truth of God into a lie. So the second point tonight is changing the truth of God. We had changing the glory of God. Here's changing the truth of God, and they change it into a lie. Let's read the rest of the verse. It says, and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, it used to be, this is actually when I was a kid. Many of you, when you were kids, or long before that even, um, uh, well, long before that, before you were even born, this was the case. It used to be that any time the Bible was brought up in conversation, it was a given that, oh yeah, the Bible is true. It used to be that way. Even people who didn't go to church and might not even been saved, they had a reverence and respect for the Bible, and many people would say, yeah, that's true. Even if they didn't really know a whole lot about it, they had a, a respect for it as the truth. Well, those days of believing that the Bible is true, those days are long gone. Now, I'm not saying you can't believe that. You should believe that. I'm just saying we're in the minority today, people who believe the Bible is true. According to the world we live in, if you believe the Bible, you believe a book full of lies. Isn't that what the verse says? They change the truth of God into a what? A lie. Now, let me give you an example. Did you know 
that the Bible is full of contradictions. When people want to attack the Bible, that is usually the first thing that they say. Oh, you don't realize the Bible has all kinds of contradictions. So I looked this up. I said, I want to just see what comes up when I start Googling biblical contradictions. And one of the first things I came across was the American Atheist website. And here's what they said. Quote, it is a central dogma of all fundamental Christians that the Bible is without error. They teach this conclusion by reasoning that God cannot be the author of false meaning and he cannot lie. Is this true? If written by a perfect being, then it must not contradict itself. As a collection of books written by different men at different times over many centuries would be expected to contradict each other. So in quote. So this website, I'll read you some of this. They had several so-called contradictions from the Bible. Now, you need to study these things because they'll help you in dealing with people who don't believe the Bible and bring this up. You ought to study some of these things. Most of these apparent contradictions or supposed contradictions are easily resolved. There's a few that still stump me, and I still ask the Lord to show me, and one day he will, and whenever he's ready. But I'm not going to let that prevent me from just still believing what God said is true. But so many of these are easily resolved. So I'm going to actually give you a couple tonight that are so easily resolved. This is straight from the American Atheist website. So these are not, I didn't come up with these. So one of the contradictions they had here is the Sabbath day. So they, they brought up Exodus 28, 20 verse 8, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that's given to Moses and the Israelites under the law, correct? Well, then they said there's a contradiction when you get to the New Testament. Romans 14, 5 says this, one man esteemeth one day above another, one, another esteemeth every day the same, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And they say, look, the New Testament says it doesn't matter if you keep the Sabbath holy, essentially is what it's saying, because you can treat any day the way, every, any way you want, whereas it says over there in Exodus, there's one particular day of the week you must keep holy. There's a contradiction! Okay, some people are shaking their heads. No, good. Somebody want to help me out with this? That is not a contradiction. If you were here for principles of Bible study, this is easy. Somebody want to help me out here? Go ahead, Miss Katie. Yeah. Okay, you hit, there's one thing. Dispensationally, go ahead. When you read the Bible, thank you so much. I'm so glad you guys caught right on to that. When you read the Bible, the first question you must ask you must say, where am I reading? And who is this written to? Because all the Bible, all 66 books are for you. They're for you, for your learning. But they are all, not all written directly to a Christian living in the church age. Is it okay to read something written to somebody else like you're reading somebody else's mail? In this sense, that's okay. And you can learn from it. But... If it's not written to you, God did not intend for you to make sure that you followed that particular, in this case, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Now, can you, you want to keep the Sabbath day? Can you? Yeah. Have at it. Go, all, go for it. You want, to, you, want to, you want to make Saturday your Sabbath day or Sunday your Sabbath day? Go for it. You want to make Wednesday? Your, you can do that. Do you have to do that? A Christian living in the church age does not have to observe the Sabbath. If you choose to do so, it's okay. You can. You can choose to go just like the Old Testament Jew did. You can do that if you want, but you don't have to. So that one is so easily resolved, isn't it? That's not a contradiction. Okay, so I got to read one more to you because this just gets really comical. Another one of the contradictions the American Atheist website brought up was this thing about human sacrifice as found in the Bible. And they bring up Leviticus 18, 21, which says, thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. Leviticus 18, 21. So help me out with what that means there. What were the, is, that's to the Israelites, what are they not supposed to do? Don't sacrifice their children to false idols. In fact, you will not find but one man in the Bible who is actually told to sacrifice his son. That's Abraham, but God did not let him finish the job. That was a test. God tested Abraham. So God does not actually command anybody in the Bible to sacrifice a child. But 
they go on and they're trying to obviously show you a contradiction. So they, they bring up Judges 11 and a man that you're probably familiar with, Jephthah. And I'll read this. It says, this is from Jephthah, Judges 11. Jephthah says, if thou, he's praying to God, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So what they're telling you is when Jephthah said that, that was okay for him to say that and for him to be willing to offer up whatever he saw, and it happened to be his daughter. It was okay for him to do that, but they say, oh, look, there's a contradiction in Leviticus that says not to do anything like that. So here's what they say. I, I got to read this because coming from them, it's really interesting. They say the terms were acceptable to God. Was Jephthah's terms acceptable to the Lord? He was actually saying something he never should have said. The terms were acceptable to God. Remember, he, God, is supposed to be omniscient and know the future. So he gave victory to Jephthah. And first, the first thing that greeted him upon his return was his daughter. As God knew that would happen, if God is God, true to his vow, Jephthah made a human sacrifice of his only child to God. So what they're saying is God knew it was going to be his daughter that he saw first, and God allowed him to make that vow, so God must have been okay with it. When I read that story, I realize that you got to be careful what you say because you can make a promise, and it can be a foolish promise. And Jephthah never should have made that promise. That was not something God told him to do. So God sat back there and watched that whole thing and thought, he never should have done that. He wasn't supposed to do that. So they twist that thing around, try to say, oh, look, there's a contradiction in the Bible. When what they do, they completely misinterpreted the Jephthah passage in Judges. So they could try to show you that there's a contradiction in the Bible. See what they are? A bunch of devils, aren't they? A bunch of lying devils. So if you would, go over to John 7. Let's change gears here. Now, the, the crowd that doesn't believe the Bible, you would expect that from them, right? You'd expect them to poke fun at the Bible and try to find contradictions. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Well, what about other Christian people? Yeah. If you're here for Sunday school, this will go hand in hand with some of the things we talked about in Sunday school. Look at John chapter 7, verse 6. John 7, 6. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Now watch verse 8. He's telling his disciples here. Verse 8. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet, for my time is not yet full come. I'm going to read that again. Go ye up into this feast. I go not up yet under this feast for my time is not yet full come and if you read the rest of the chapter guess where jesus goes he goes to the feast so he sends the disciples ahead of him and he says i go not up yet you see that in verse eight now i'm going to read to you out of the new international version i'm going to read you verse eight you follow along in your king james bible you go to the festival I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. They just made the Lord Jesus Christ a liar because in the New International Version in John chapter 7, later on in the chapter, Jesus Christ goes up to the feast. But in the NIV, what did he say in verse 8? I am not going up to this festival. What word is in your King James Bible that makes all the difference? Verse 8 in your King James Bible, I go not up yet unto this feast. If you take out that word yet, Jesus Christ in the New International Version told a lie. And you know he's not a liar. Because God cannot lie. And he is God manifest in the flesh. Wow. They changed the truth of God into a lie that's your scholarly christian crowd that did that wow that's one of a few we could have talked about here i'll give you another one go to john three you're in john seven go by john three 
another. The, the, hey, in your, in your Bible, you know this from Bible study. Every word is important. The words, the individual words make all the difference. Amen? John 3, 16. You know the verse. So uh, I will read the verse. You can follow along in your King James Bible. I'll read it in the New International Version. And practically every English translation besides the King James will say something similar to what I'm going to read here. So you follow along, verse 16. I'll read it out of the New International Version. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, I know there's a few words that are changed there, but I want to focus on one particular change. It's in the first part there. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Okay, what's your King James Bible say? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, begotten. There is something physical always associated. I say that. Most instances, and in this case, there's a physical association with the word begotten, indicating that person who was begotten had a father and was born. Obviously, had to have a mother, too, and was physically born, correct? So this, actual, this verse actually speaks of the only begotten son, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, right? But in a New International Version, it says he gave his one and only son. Okay, flip over to John 1, 12. I'll come back to this in a second. We'll finish it up, but let me just show you this. John 1, 12. But as many as received him. Is that you? Yes. To them gave he power to become the what? The sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, if you're saved, guess what you are? It's in the bulletin today as well. I had some things about that. Guess what you are? You are a son of God. John 3, 16, the New International Version says he gave his one and only son. How many sons does God have? One only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm looking at a bunch of sons of God in this room right now <laughs> by the new birth. So you see how the words make all the difference. Changing the truth of God into a lie. Isn't that something? Go back to Romans 1 here. Look what happens as they continue down the slippery slope. Look what happens when men change God's truth into a lie. It gets worse. They change the glory of God. They change the truth of God. Look what it says here. Verse 25, it says, uh, Change the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature. More than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. Who do men worship today? Other men. That's what they do, whether it be celebrities, professional athletes, politicians, even scholars get praise and glory from men instead of God Almighty receiving the praise and the glory and the worship. Okay, now look what the result is when men change the truth of God. Look at verse 26. For unto this God, cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Now it's going to get a little worse here. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So if you notice 24, verse 24, God also gave them up to uncleanness. 26, God gave them up unto vile affections. So you know what I, when I, when I read that, I recognize that God responds to a man, an individual, based on how that person responds to God. So when an individual rejects God as creator and refuses to give him glory, God responds and sends him down a path, gives him up to uncleanness. And then when he continues on and rejects the word of God or changes it, it gets a little worse. God gives him up unto vile affection. So what do you think of when you think of the word affection? What comes to mind? Caring. Caring, loving, right? What kind of affections did God give them up to? What does it say there? Vile affections. So that's disgusting types of affections. Unnatural types of affections, which we'll get to right here in this verse, actually. Here's the third thing. We've got change in the glory of God. We've got change in the truth of God. Look at what happens here in verse 26. It says, Second half of the verse, for even their women did change 
the natural use into that which is against nature. So the third point here tonight is changing the plan of God. So we got changing the glory of God, changing the truth of God. Here's changing the plan of God. So I know you know what we're going to show you this not, tonight. Uh, you already know this, but I think that we just need to be reminded, and here's why. We live in a world that completely, so many people completely disagree with what I'm about to show you from the Bible. And I will give you the evidence here in a minute. So go to Genesis chapter 2. Let's find out the plan of God for a man and a woman. Genesis 2. You say, oh, don't, doesn't everybody know that? No! Everybody doesn't know the plan of God for a man and the plan of God for a woman. Our world can't figure it out. Isn't that something they can't figure out? They actually can't even give you a definition of what a man or what a woman actually is. Your Bible's going to lay this out as plain as day. Look at verse 8. Uh, actually, verse 7. 2 7. Genesis 2 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Okay, skip down there to verse 20, and you'll see something here. It says, God gave, uh, Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now watch verse 24. Therefore, here's God's plan. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You have a man and a woman. We would say male and female. Is there any other besides male and female? Now, you know that, but our world doesn't want to. Here's the thing. Our world knows that. They don't want to acknowledge it. They know it's true because God put a conscience in them that even reveals something as basic as that, obviously, something as basic as that. So I did a little looking around here, and I found this website. Uh, I'll, I, I can tell you what the website is. I, don't, I didn't put it on my notes here, but this is actually, what I'm going to read you is written by a man, a biological male. His name is Harley Preston. Here's what he wrote. And I, I'm reading this. I know you're probably going to get disgusted when I read some of this, but I'm reading this to give you a glimpse into the world we are living in. To show you the Bible is 100% accurate in its description of how things will be when a, an individual or a society rejects God. So here's a little, just a small excerpt. There's, there's a lot to this. I'll just, I may not read everything I got here. I'll just, we'll see how this goes. Quote, this is from Harley Preston. Quote, as trans women like me struggle to be seen and respected as women, the most frustrating conversation to witness has been the one that probes at a trans woman's realness. It is a question that is so seemingly simple, yet insidious at its core as violence towards trans women continues. What is a woman? This question brings divisiveness into the fold as people connect semantics with biology. Linguistics and definitions become a hurdle for someone like me to overcome. There's a silent threat in those four simple words that aims to dismantle the logic. Dismantle the logic that trans women are in fact women. End quote. Safe time for comment here. This is a man who said trans women are in fact women. And he says they aim to dismantle the logic. Professing themselves to be what? Wise. What are they really? See, this man, biological man, thinks that he's smart, but he is deluded in his thinking here. I'll go on here. Quote, as it is, common definitions of woman are often associated with an adult female human. 
In other words, of or denoting the sex that can bear offspring or produce eggs. Now, let's face the facts here. I can't do either of those things. I lack the ability to bear offspring, to produce eggs, or to menstruate, and some people will use that very def definition of woman as a weapon to attack the notion that I am deserving of womanhood. And to complement that, this logic insinuates that I and women like me are nothing more than men with a mental illness. <laughs> to, be, <laughs> to be a woman is much more nuanced and complicated than a mere biological function, end quote. What? I'll read that again. To be a woman is much more nuanced and complicated than a mere biological function. Okay, so here's a man who wants to be a woman. Let's go back to Romans 1, and you will see it is as clear as a bell why people think like this. You might be wondering, why are you taking the time to do this? It's kind of weird. This explains perfectly why our world thinks the way they do. I scratch my head just like you do, and I say, how do they believe this? Romans chapter 1 lays it out and explains to you why people believe like this. So, if you look there, it says, verse 26, For this cause God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Okay, let's stop on that one. You have women today who want to identify as men. And then if you look at 27, you'll see this actually lines up with the, the fellow I read here. Look at 27, likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Okay, so this man here I read about desires to be a woman. So my guess is this particular man probably seeks out other biological men. So you see how twisted this becomes? It's a man who wants to be a woman, but then seeks after other men. But then in other instances... This same man who thinks he's a woman will seek after other men who think they're women and other women who think they're men. Yeah, thank you, Miss Katie. You just throw your hands up and put your hands on. Ah, just, yeah, no kidding. That's where we are. Now, we can sit here and say, what a bunch of crazy people. And we can even say biblically, what a bunch of fools. Folks, this is the condition of our world, and I don't bring all of this up to make you mad. I don't. I bring this up for two reasons. Number one to show you that the Bible is true in its assessment of our world, and it also explains why, and it also ought to send an alert signal up to all of us. Stick with what God said, and don't back down. Now, you don't have to be a jerk and be mean to these people who don't agree with you. In fact, that's not going to really help. What you need to do is you need to give them the truth, and you need to stick with the truth. And even when there is more and more opposition against Bible-believing Christians, make this message just a reminder and an encouragement to you. It doesn't matter how much in the minority we become, always stick with God's Word even if you're the last person left. It's worth it. It's always worth it to stick with the Lord and His Word and never leave it. Because the very moment you do, you go down this really messed up and deadly path. So then, let's go on here in your Bible. Look at verse 28. Look what else happens. God already gave them up. He gave them up again. And then look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Okay, and there's a whole list there. We won't go through all those. But I just want you to notice there, God gave them up twice, and finally he gives them over, and he gives them over to a reprobate mind. Isn't that something right there? So I tell you what let's do. Let's go over, we'll close here. Let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 6, and I'll show you something really interesting over here. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah 6, concerning that reprobate mind, they were given up to uncleanness, they were given up to vile affections, and then they were given over to a reprobate mind. Folks, this passage, 
very clearly explains why the world is in such a mess. Don't let that stop you from continuing to be the light that God made you to be here in this dark world with people who have darkened hearts. Continue to be that light because the world needs it. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6 and look at verse, uh, let's, let's pick it up here in verse 27. God telling Jeremiah something that he's set him to do. Verse 27, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed to the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Watch this, verse 30. Reprobate silver shall men call them. Now watch it. Because the Lord hath done what? rejected them. So when I read that verse and I connect it with what we saw in Romans 1, when an individual is given over to a reprobate mind, essentially what has God done with that person? There's the proof right there. Verse 30, the Lord hath rejected them. Wow. We're in a society that God has rejected and it's not like he didn't give them a chance. He continued to give them a chance. Now, here's what you have to be very careful of. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Be very careful about assuming that people have been given over to a reprobate mind. You don't know at what point that happens. God knows. Now, we can get some ideas from Romans 1. We can get some really good ideas about when that happens. But I really don't know because, number one, I'm not God. Number two, I'm not that individual who's rejecting God. So only the Lord knows. So in the meantime, you just need to assume that everybody out there is salvageable. Amen? Because I've heard some testimonies of people who were headed down this path. I mean, a long ways down this path, living this wicked homosexual lifestyle and got saved out of it. Amen to that. Indicating that there was still a chance for them. So don't you ever assume that, oh, this person or this group of people or all of our society or so many people in our society are given over and there's no chance for them. Don't you say that. When you start thinking like that, you become very Calvinistic in your thinking. You say, oh, that person can't get saved. It's not your job to say that. Okay, now God may, may be there with that person, but you don't know that. So continue to give out the truth. Continue to be the light. And in spite of the direction this world goes, keep living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go back to Romans 1. Keep, go back here. Look at the verse. I didn't read this to start off with, but it's a great verse to end on. Right before Paul says all that, he actually tells us what we should do in spite of all that. Look at Romans 1.16. Paul knew this would be the case. He knew there would be a day coming when this would be the most of the society. But look what he says in verse 16. He says, for I am not what? Ashamed. Ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, that's the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation. Watch the wording. To who? Everyone. Everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says that before he goes on about all this, indicating our job, our purpose is to get the truth out, to get the gospel out in spite of all the craziness surrounding us. So I would just challenge you as we close here, while the world and so much of our world lives right here in Romans 1, 19 to 32, you don't have to live in all that. Rise above it through Jesus Christ because didn't he rise from the dead? Gave you the power, the resurrection power to live in this world, even though it's messed up, to live for him in this dark world, live your life according to the truth of God's word and be ready to be part of the faithful few who are not afraid to stand on the truth of God's word. So let me recap here. They're changing the glory of God. How about we give glory to God, the glory he deserves? They're changing the truth of God into a lie. How about we just wrap our arms around the truth? And continue to make it a part of who we are. And then it says the last thing there. It says they have uh, changed God's plan. They've changed the plan of God. Don't you mess with God's plan for your life. It doesn't look the same for everybody. God's plan for every individual. 
You got to find that out. I mentioned that this morning. You got to get with God alone in, in prayer and His Word and have Him show you what His plan is for you. Don't you leave that plan. Stick on that plan that God has laid out for you all the way to the end. All right? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for just showing us so much truth about the world we live in. It is clear as a bell why our world is a mess. You tell us very plainly. And I pray that we would not just throw our hands up in the air and give up. But instead, we would truly live for you and rise above the nonsense of this world and allow you to empower us through the, the Lord Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit to live according to the truth, to live in a manner that glorifies you, and to live out the plan that you have for each one of us. I pray that we would just make commitment here tonight, each one of us, to really live this next week for your glory and to stick with your truth. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.